good Sunday when you get to watch a baptism like that. Thanks for sharing that with us, Dave. Um, so we're in part two of the series, Illusions, and I wondered if you all want to see an illusion this morning. Anybody? A couple of you. Good. Thank you. We have a little more excitement this time around. Last week was a little bit of a downer. Ethan, can I borrow you for a second? Do you mind coming up here and helping me? I just get a young person on stage here. Uh, so I've got three cards. I've got a joker, a three of hearts, and another joker. And are you pretty fast? You can see what's going on. Yeah. Okay, good, good. Um, So what I want you to do, it's really simple. I just want you to grab the three of hearts, okay? So you can all see where the three of hearts is. You want to grab the three of hearts. Now, you remember where the three of hearts is, right? You can keep, keep it in mind. Okay, all right. Go ahead. Let's see how fast you were. Did you get it? No. What did he end up with? The tree of hearts, which is really close, but not the same. Thank you, Ethan, for coming up here and participating with me. Yeah, so um, that's kind of fun, isn't it? It's, it's an illusion because you thought you were seeing something, but you actually weren't. Um, we've been talking about this in relation to temptation because we've been saying that temptation is really all about illusions. We think we see something right in front of us. We think the issue with temptation is the date. We think the issue is texting him back or texting her back or it's something with work or it's a relationship, it's something with school. We think that we can see everything right here in front of us, but the truth is, we can't. It's just an illusion. There's always something bigger. There's always something hidden underneath the surface. And so last week, in case you weren't with us, we talked about some principles of illusions, and we're just going to talk about those really briefly today to summarize in case you weren't able to be with us. But we said illusions promise truth while hiding an important piece of reality. Every time you see a magic trick, every time you see an illusion, there's something that's hidden from you, and it's the piece that's hidden that's actually the most important piece. It's the gimmick, it's the sliding door, it's the magnet, it's the gaffed card, it's the special deck, it's whatever. You know, it's something that you can't see, and it's because you can't see it, because you don't see everything that's involved, that illusions challenge our confidence in reality. Because Ethan, when you came up here, you were pretty certain, right? You knew what it was, but actually you were wrong because I had deceived you, right? Because that's the third piece about illusions. Illusions are lies. Illusions are lies. They are deceptions, and behind a deception is generally a deceiver. Now, the reason we're talking about all this isn't because I like talking about illusions, though I do. The reason we're talking about this is because we said illusions are at the root of all of our temptations, our illusions are at the root of all of our temptations, whether big or small, whether it's to eat an extra Oreo or to, you know, get into a relationship you know you shouldn't get into. Illusions are at the root of all of our temptations. And the thing we talked about last week that was so important, the thing we talked about last week is that we can all think about times where we've given into a temptation. And because we gave into the temptation, we ended up sacrificing something far greater than what we thought we were sacrificing. We thought it was about the date. We thought it was about the promotion. We thought about it was about the purchase, the thing that we really wanted. But what we ended up doing was sacrificing a relationship down the road in a future. We ended up sacrificing jobs. I know people who have lost jobs because they gave into a temptation. We end up sacrificing things that are important to us, our families. We end up sacrificing, most importantly, our faith, when we give in to temptation, because there's always more at stake. There's always something underneath the surface. Now, for most of us in the room, we can, as I said, think about times where we have sacrificed our future, we've sacrificed our family or our friends uh, because we gave in to temptation, but there could be some of you in the room because somebody invited you to come here and you're not sure where you fall on the whole faith perspective thing, where, you know, you, you get the family and the faith, or the family and the future thing, but you don't really get the faith piece because you're not really sure God's even there to begin with. And so what we're going to talk about today may feel a little bit disconnected for you because we're going to address the whole faith piece and you're going to get a bird's eye view into what Christians deal with on a regular basis as it comes to temptation. But if that's you, I just want to invite you to lean in really closely because what we're going to talk about may give you some indication and some help in understanding why you're so challenged with faith. Because faith and temptation are so tied up with one another. And it's when we have uh, the right understanding of faith and temptation that we're actually able to gain some victory and some progress in dealing with our temptations. And so today, for those of us in the room who are Christians, we're going to talk about that connection that doesn't feel like it's there. 
in the midst of temptation, it feels like it's the event. It feels like it's the thing. It feels like it's just a need I'm trying to fulfill or, you know, some peace that I want in my life or numbing a pain. I mean, it just feels like it's about this thing. But the truth is, it's always greater than that. In fact, this is kind of the bottom line for the series. It's the bottom line for today. And that's that temptation is always about faith. It's always a test of our faith. And so last week we learned an important phrase. We learned uh, to say, temptation, you're just an illusion. Temptation, you're just an illusion. You will not steal my future and you will not steal my faith because I know there is more going on here than I realize. It seems so isolated in the moment. It seems like it's just about this thing, but the truth is it's always about something far bigger. Our families, our futures, and our faith are at stake. Now, um, there are all kinds of different faith perspectives that you can come from. Uh, One of the faith perspectives is that God is just kind of this big guy up in the sky. (laughs) He's kind of this ethereal God up there who, uh, you know, is kind of disconnected from reality. Maybe he spun the world into existence or he created the world, but uh, he helps the sunrise and the stars shine. But aside from that, you know, God's largely disengaged with life. Sometimes people's uh, relationship with God is more about, you know, praying before a Thanksgiving meal or a holiday meal or showing up at church on Christmas and Easter. But the idea that God would be interested in our lives, that God would want to be involved in our lives, seems a little bit foreign. And so sometimes the approach to life is that when you see something you want or you see something you need or you see some desire you want to fulfill or something you think will bring you joy, you do what you need to do in order to get it. In fact, sometimes the mentality can be a little bit along the lines of, if I don't, it won't. If I don't do it, it's not going to happen. If I don't, he won't. If I don't, she won't. If I don't, God's certainly not going to do it. And so it rests on my shoulders. And a person who kind of takes that faith perspective, uh, when they pray, the prayers are more along the lines of, God, give me some good luck, (laughs) because that's what I need here. I need to figure out how I can get what it is that I want to get. And so there may be some rules I need to bend. You know, sometimes it's easier to ask forgiveness than it is permission. Uh, That can be a mantra of somebody whose perspective is along these lines, that I need to do what I need to do in order to make things happen the way I need to make them happen because God is this disconnected being up in the sky. And yeah, it's great that he's there, but he's not involved in my personal day-to-day life. So I'm going to do whatever it is that I need to do to get whatever it is that I want to get. Now, there are others of us who were taught and who believe that um, God isn't this disconnected, detached being up in the sky, but that he's actually a personal God who wants a relationship with us. And that he cares about my relationships. He cares about my financial situation. He cares about my work situation. And he's invited us not to call him heavenly creator or heavenly being, but he's invited us to call him heavenly father because he wants a relationship with us. And so he invites us to bring our concerns to him and say, God, I need you to step into this relationship. God, you know what this desire is in my life, but I don't know if I can get it. I, want, I need your help, because I can't get it without bending the rules or breaking the rules or doing something that violates my morals or my ethics and going against what I believe your will is. So God, I need you to step in and help with my finances, my relationship, my school, my work. God, I believe that I'm going to trust in you. Those are two completely different approaches to life. When the moment comes up where I have a need, I have a desire, I have, you know, a joy or something that I think will bring me pleasure or numb my pain comes up, how will I approach that situation? Will I believe that it rests on my shoulders, that it's up to me, that God's this detached being, or will I believe that God is there, that God does care, and that he will meet my needs according to his timing and his plan? See, the illusion is, the illusion is it's up to me. The illusion is, I've got to figure this out. I've got to make this happen by my own accord, by my own account. The illusion is that I have to do everything because God's not there and God can't be trusted. But the thing is, temptation is always a test of our faith. Temptation is always a test of our faith. And so in those moments, when we face that temptation, What if, I mean, we talked about this a little bit last week, but what if we could just pause? What if in those moments we could just pause for just a second and say, could God meet this need in my life? Could God meet this need in my life? Is God aware? 
I mean, does he care? I've got this relational need. You know, I want to go out on Friday nights, but all the options are really bad, and my friends are doing things that they shouldn't be doing, and so I've chosen to stay inside on Friday nights, but I feel lonely. And so could God meet my relational needs in some way? I mean, is he able to do that? Is he able to step in and help me in ways that I feel like I need help? Is he there? Does he care? Or I've got this work situation, and I, I mean, everybody else is kind of bending the rules, breaking the rules to move up in the corporate ladder, but I'm still at the bottom because I haven't been bending the rules and breaking the rules, and it would sure be easier, and everybody else seems to be doing it. Does God care enough about my situation? Does he care enough about me that he would be able to meet this need in my life? Does he care about my educational goals? Does he care about my relationships? Does he care about my need for intimacy? Do I have to take that all on my own shoulders? Or can I believe that God will step in because he cares, because he's there? Is God just this detached being, or can I trust him with the things that are important in my life? Do I need to do what I need to do to accomplish my own objectives, even if it violates my morals, even if it violates standards that I believe, or can I trust that God will do all that he's promised to do? Will he meet that need? Can I trust him? To do that. See, here's the thing. That's, this is why it's so important because temptation is always an issue of faith. It is always an issue of faith because when we stop believing and trusting, when we stop trusting, we stop obeying. And when we stop obeying, then we stop believing. It's just a matter of time. I know more atheists who have become atheists, not because they had these grand big questions about is God real, you know? It came down to a lack of trust. They stopped trusting God. And because they stopped trusting God, they stopped obeying God. And because they stopped obeying God, ultimately they just stopped believing in God because God was an irrelevant piece of their lives. But I'm telling you, I'm telling you, every time we're in temptation, there is an invitation to express our trust and our confidence in our Heavenly Father, whether or not He will fulfill and step in and do the very thing that we believe He can and will do. Now, throughout this series, we've been looking at um, the story of Jesus' temptation, and so if you've got your Bible, we're going to take a look at that. We're going to look at the next step in Jesus' temptation. It's in the book of Matthew, so uh, if you're new to Bible study, Matthew is the first chapter of the New Testament, or the first book, rather, of the New Testament, and we'll have it on the screen here in just a second. But in this um, story, as we kind of began unpacking it last week, um, Jesus is baptized, and then he immediately goes from baptism into temptation. In fact, we're about to see that, that the Spirit of God actually leads him into uh, the desert where he's going to be tempted. And it's kind of this strange sort of thing where you think, that's, that's weird. I mean, God just celebrated Jesus' baptism, kind of like we celebrated a baptism today, and then all of a sudden, uh, Jesus is whisked away into the desert where he's going to face temptation. And the thing we talked about last week was the idea that um, that 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 um, totally lost my train of thought. The thing we talked about last week, if I can get back on track, was that the specifics of this temptation don't necessarily matter. The specifics don't matter because none of us is going to be tempted in the way that Jesus was tempted, right? I mean, none of us is going to be taken up to the top of the building and said, hey, if you jump off, see if an angel will catch you. That's not going to happen. Or if you just bow down for a second, you know, you can have all the kingdoms of the world. Or can you take these stones and can you turn them into bread? Nobody's going to be tempted in that regard. But where the temptations are valuable for us and for our understanding is because there are three times where Jesus was tempted to do something in his own power rather than trusting his heavenly father to step in. And these temptations were very real. If they weren't temptations, then we wouldn't call them temptations. If Jesus didn't want these things, then they wouldn't be called temptations. So these were very real for him as he's approached with these options of things to do, ways to kind of get ahead where he wants to go in life without having to go through the pain of what God was going to have him go through. And so that's kind of where we're going to pick up the story. Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. We read this. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And we said last week the word tempt really can be translated as test. And when we understand what a test is, it's to prove the validity of something. It's to prove how strong something is and, and to check whether or not somebody understands what they need to understand. So he went into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. That's kind of a weird temptation because it almost seems a little innocuous. It seems kind of unimportant, doesn't it? 
I mean, the tempter's going up to Jesus and be like, hey, Jesus, you know, you're kind of hungry, aren't you? He's like, yeah, I've been fasting for 40 days. Of course I'm hungry, and you're the son of God, right? Yeah, I'm the son of God. So you could turn these stones into bread, right? Yeah, I could. So, so why don't you go ahead and do it? And to be honest, if when we're reading this story, if we had read that Jesus turned the stones into bread and sat down on the rock and had a picnic with the devil, we'd think to ourselves, that is really strange. <laughs> you know, where did that come from? But we wouldn't think, oh, Jesus caved to this great temptation. You know, I can't believe he did that. I mean, honestly, we would just think that's a strange story and we'd probably keep on reading. But Jesus understood that there was something far greater than just whether or not he would turn these stones into bread, that there was something far deeper going on. And the reason we know that is because how he responded to the temptation because he responded to the temptation by reaching back into the history of the nation of Israel. Back, back, back in the days when Moses was leading the people. Now, you may know the story that the Israelites were a slave nation for 400 years. Now think about that. For 400 years, a slave nation. Our country has existed for not even 250 years. And think how far back our history goes. And I mean, it's kind of foggy, right? After you've had history class and it's been a couple decades, you're like, what happened back in the, you know, 17 whatever and, and whatever that was. And so, I mean, but think for 400 years, that's all they knew. There weren't modern history books. There wasn't the World War II or History Channel. Um, you know, they just, they just knew what they, they had been told and by, their, by their relatives and their grandparents and their parents and their great-grandparents and their great-great-great-grandparents. I mean, back generations, all they knew is that they were slaves. They did exactly as the Egyptians told them to do. And they were tempted to wonder, is God there? Does God care? And they cried out to God, and eventually, after 400 years, he raised up a man named Moses who led them to freedom. And they crossed over the Red Sea on dry ground, and um, Pharaoh's army, half of Pharaoh's army, drowned in the process. And then they get to the other side, and there are about two million of them. Think about that, two million of them, and they're going to become traipsing around in the desert, and they've got to eat. They've got to have some food to eat. And so they're thinking to themselves, how are we going to eat? God, how are you going to provide for us to eat? And he did it miraculously through this thing called manna. And they'd wake up in the morning, and they'd kind of stretch, you know, do their morning thing, and they'd walk out the tent, and breakfast came to them. I mean, it was like right there. And they just had to collect it off the ground. Sometimes they baked it into cakes. It had a nice honey-like flavor to it. And God provided for them in this amazingly miraculous way, day in and day out. And he said, look, I I just want to teach you to trust me, and so I just want you to collect enough for today because it'll go rotten overnight if you keep extra, and then tomorrow there will be more. And so they would do that. The next day, they'd wake up. They'd collect new manna. They would eat it. They'd go to bed. They'd wake up the next day. They'd collect new manna. They'd eat it. They'd go to bed. They'd wake up the next day. You get the idea. And the process went on and on and on for 40 years. Now think about that. For 40 years, that was their daily experience. For 40 years, God was ingraining something very strong and important into them. And as they were getting ready to leave the the desert and move into the promised land that God had provided for them, Moses went through this kind of debriefing experience with them. We call it the book of Deuteronomy. And in there, he summarizes everything that had happened, and he kind of talks to the Israelites. And what he says to them is, look, when you move into this land, you're going to have property, you're going to be able to grow crops, you're going to have livestock, you'll have your own armies, you'll have your own cities. And you'll be tempted to believe that it's all because of you that you have everything that you have. But I don't want you to forget that it wasn't you who provided all these things. It was God who provided them. Take a look at what he says in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2. Moses says this. He says, remember. Remember, which, by the way, why do we tell people to remember things? Because we think they'll do what? Forget. Yeah, I mean, you don't tell somebody to remember something if you're not concerned about them forgetting. You tell them to remember it because it's really important and you want them to pick that up at the store for you or you want to make sure that they, you know, do whatever it is that you're telling them to do. It's important. So he says, remember, which is a key word, remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years. Remember, because this is very important. Here's why he did it. To humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart. Not for the fun of it, but because God wanted to know what was going on on the inside of you. And then he says this, he says, whether or not you would keep his commands. That's fascinating. The reason God did this is because he wanted you to 
Obey him. Because God cares about that. You've been wondering, is God this detached being in the sky who isn't invested and interested in our lives? And the answer to that is no. He's not a detached being. He's a personal God who cares deeply for you and about you and about the things that you are going through in life. And he wants you to trust him. He wants you to obey him. Now, we don't think about this very often, but please don't miss this. It's super important to what we're talking about today. Obedience is a trust issue, isn't it? You don't obey people you don't trust. This is why, you know, sometimes parents like to count for their children and say, you better stop by the count of three, one, two, three. Your children don't trust that you're going to do anything until you get to three. They know your action point. They know where you're actually going to do something. And so because they don't trust, they don't obey. Okay? I mean, it's the same was going on with the people of Israel. The same was going on with the people of Israel. Do you trust me? Do you trust me? I want you to trust me because trust is important with obedience. Trust is important with obedience. In fact, if we believe what God says, we'll do, if we see as God sees, we'll do as God says. If we could actually see things from his point of view and from his perspective, I think we'd do what God says. The problem is we can't, right? We can't see as God sees. Otherwise, that would make us God. If we could see from his perspective and know everything that he knows and have the knowledge and the abilities that he has, that would make us God. But because we're not God, there's, that's where faith is and trust come into it. In fact, I don't think the biggest trust issue with Christianity comes down to whether or not you can believe Jesus is who he claimed to be. I think there is so much evidence for that that, uh, you know, it's easier to believe that than it is to believe in the opposite option. The real trust issue comes down to will I believe what God says? Will I believe what God says? Will I believe that he can see differently? And if I saw as God sees, I'd do as he said, and so I'm going to choose to obey. This was a trust issue. This was an obedience issue. And Moses was saying, look, God wants you to obey. But rooted in obedience is trust. And here's how he did it for Israel. Here's how he taught them. Because he set up binary situations, you know, where you you have an option. (laughs) I will or won't trust. I will or won't trust. Here's how he did it. He humbled you. He did it. It wasn't your choice. He humbled you, causing you to hunger, and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known. He made you wonder how you're going to eat so that he could show you how you were going to eat. He built within you a hunger. I mean, it's almost like a crazy girlfriend, but God's not a crazy girlfriend who like sets up situations to test you or whatever. Um, Sorry, ladies. But but the idea is that, that he created this need within you so he could meet it. He created this need within you so he could meet it so that you would know he's trustworthy. He wants you to know that you can place your confidence in him. And here's why he did it. To teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Look, most like Israelites, don't you understand? God has been teaching you a lesson for these last 40 years. He's been teaching you the lesson that food is not enough for life. But even God knows you need food. And even he is going to provide it. But there's something you need that's even greater than food, and that's placing yourself under the canopy of God's care and of God's will and being obedient to what God wants for you and for your life. God knows what you need, and he's going to provide it. And in those moments, Moses connected the dots from Israel's obedience to God's provision and Israel's needs to God's provision and saying, look, more than you, those needs being fulfilled You need me. You need to obey because my commands are good. They are for your good. Man doesn't live on bread alone. But when we place ourselves under the canopy of God's care and of God's grace, and we realize that he's there and that he cares and that he will meet our needs according to his plans. The story continues. Verse 11, Moses says, Be careful. Be careful. Again, why do you tell people to be careful? Because you're afraid they're about to do something foolish, right? (laughs) When there's a hot burner right there and your kid's reaching up, be careful, no, you know, or getting at the edge of a mountain. My mom was afraid of heights. She's always, be careful, get away from the side, you're going to fall off. So Moses is like, this is the big warning, be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God because it'd be easy to do so. Don't forget that the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, and his decrees that I'm giving you this day. 
Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. In other words, he's saying, I'm concerned that when you have more than you need, you'll forget and suddenly you won't trust. And when you stop trusting, you stop obeying. And when you stop obeying, eventually you just stop believing. So he says, you may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me, but remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. God says, I created those needs inside of you, those needs that you want to fulfill, those desires that you have, those things that you're concerned with. You're lonely. Who do you think created you with the desire for companionship? Who do you think built that within you? I did. Can I meet that need in a way that's appropriate, in a way that doesn't violate my morals, my will, my commands? Can I meet that need for you? Or are you responsible for figuring that out? You're hungry. I get that. I created a need for hunger. I created a desire to eat. So can you trust me to meet that? Or is it all going to rest on your shoulders? Or you have a need for intimacy. Who do you think created that? Whose idea do you think that was, Israel? I created that in you. I made you for that. So can I be trusted to meet it in a way that's appropriate? Or do I need to take matters into my own hands? Do you and I need to take matters into our own hands? Does Israel need to take matters into their own hands and say, I'm going to bend the rules, break the rules, ignore the rules, because I believe if I don't, it won't. If I don't take control of the situation, God's certainly not going to do anything for me, and I've got to do it because it all rests on my shoulders. Temptation is so much bigger than the issue at hand. Temptation is an issue of trust. Will I, can I believe my Heavenly Father? Will I trust Him? And see, Jesus knew that. He knew that. Back in the desert when he's tempted by the devil, he knew that the the issue was so much bigger than just turning stones into bread. The issue is, can I trust my heavenly father? And Satan tried to present this illusion, just like I did with Ethan over here with the, the three of hearts. You know, I just presented this illusion. You know, just, it's just this. It's just this. You're hungry, right? You know what the three of hearts is, right? Just grab it. Just grab it. You know what you want. You know what you need. You can do it. Just provide for yourself, Jesus. Nobody's gonna care. And yet Jesus realized it was so much bigger than that. He says, no, I'm not going to doubt my heavenly father because God spoke about this in history. This has happened before, back in the days of Israel. In fact, here's what he said, verse 4 of Matthew chapter 4. Jesus answered him. He says, it is written, it is written, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Yes, I'm hungry, but God knows I'm hungry. And yes, I have this need, but God has made a way to meet it. And he brought me in the desert too fast for this period of time, and I'm not going to break that fast until he decides to break it for me, even if I starve in the process. Think about how powerful that statement was that Jesus made. I'm not going to give in. I'm not going to doubt. I'm not going to question my Heavenly Father because I believe. I believe that he can and he will in his timing, even if I starve to death in the process of waiting. That's powerful. That's powerful. And what if we could do that? What if we could pause and say there's so much more at risk, there's so much more at stake than just this thing because temptation is always, always, always a trust issue. So I want to ask you an important question. And the question is, in what area of your life are you tempted to meet a legitimate need in an irresponsible way? whether it's companionship or finances or something with school or something with work, a need for intimacy. And the question is, where did that need come from? Where did that need come from? Where did that desire come from? Whatever it is that you're tempted to do, where does that, where does that originate? Do you, is it possible that God created that in you? Is it possible that he recognized and designed you for it? And is it possible that he could meet that need how he wants to meet it in a way that's honoring to him without breaking the rules, without, you know, going your own way, without ignoring God's commands and God's laws? Is it possible that he's there and that he cares? 
And would you be able to wait? Would you be able to wait and just hold back and say, God, I have this need. I have this thing that's important to me. I want to experience this. I I, I want to get the promotion. I want to advance my career. I need this this relationship. I want to enjoy my retirement. God, I need this. It's important to me. But you know what's more important to me? It's an uninterrupted fellowship with you. More than having my momentary need met. Because here's the thing about momentary needs. They're they're simply appetites, aren't they? And when you feed an appetite, an appetite gets hungry again. You know, I have this pesky need of needing to eat three times a day and snacks in between. And the truth is, I feed this appetite and then I'll be hungry in another couple hours, another couple days, another couple weeks. And it's just going to keep coming back. So rather than feeding that appetite, is it possible that I could trust my Heavenly Father and trust that He will feed me when He wants to feed me? As I'm telling you, it's in that space between fulfilling the desire that you have and the time it takes to fulfill it that our faith grows. And we have an opportunity to say, "Eh, I'm going to take the matters into my own hands. I'm going to deal with it on my own. I'm going to make it happen however I need to make it happen. Or... I'm going to trust my Heavenly Father to step in. And I'm going to trust that He knows what's important to me. He knows what my needs are. And according to His time, according to His will, He will do as He desires to do. That's the invitation for all of us when it comes to temptation. Because it's always a test of our faith. You know, I think one of the best things we can do when temptation comes up is, uh, well, actually, I think it starts at the beginning of the day. You know, before your feet even hit the ground or maybe right afterward, get down on your knees and just say, God, I believe, I trust you. I'm just gonna declare right now today that I trust that you know what my needs are and that you're gonna provide for them. In fact, there are times where I will pre-think some of the temptations that I'm gonna experience. I don't know if you're like me, but I have the same temptations day in and day out, right? I mean, there aren't that many of them that seem to come after me. And so I'll just say, God, I know I'm gonna be tempted with this issue later today but I'm just going to make the decision right now to say, I'm going to trust you. I trust you. I trust you know what my needs are, and I trust that you can help me be patient for those to be fulfilled in a way that's honoring and pleasing to you. And so, God, will you help me to continue to trust you? And I just want to declare, I trust you from the get-go, because in the moment, in the moment, we see the illusion. We think, oh, no, it's just about this. It's just about being happy. It's just about numbing my pain. It's just about getting what I want, but it's always so much bigger. And the good news, we said this last week, is that Jesus didn't just die to forgive us of our sins. He died to set us free from the bondage of sin and temptation. And it's through that freedom that we can say no and that we can build our faith and our confidence and our trust in our Heavenly Father. Temptation is always an issue. It's a test of our faith. So next week, we're going to continue looking at the next temptation of Jesus. I hope you'll be back with us, but let me pray for us as we close our time together. God, I just thank you so much for this account that was recorded for us from 2,000 years ago. I thank you for the way that Jesus recognized temptation for what it is. He saw the illusion, and God, so often we, we miss the illusion. We get caught up in the moment thinking it's about now, it's about her, it's about him, it's about this promotion, it's about this money, this purchase, this thing that I really want. But it's really about our faith. And over and over as we continue giving into temptation, God, you know that it kills our faith. And more important than having that need fulfilled, is trusting you. And so God, I just pray for every one of us in the room, myself included, that you would help us this week as we face temptations, as we see things that are going on in our lives, that we would trust you, that we would trust you, that we would lean into you, that we would say no to temptation. Temptation, you're just an illusion. You will not steal my future and you will not steal my faith. Give us strength and power by your spirit to do that this week, Lord. Thank you for our time together, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.